Oh hey, featuring Fantasy Folklore, did you know they have themselves an awesome saber company called Fantasy Sabers? Well this right here is Fantasy Sabers, the brand new saber company on the block, and my friends over at Fantasy Folklore did an amazing job with these sabers. I got my hands on the Senate lightsaber, and this blade looks like it's directly out of the movie. Fantasy sends all their blades in various cases. For the replica blades, they come in this very sturdy and safe box. Upon opening it, you can see that the saber is very well protected and in perfect condition. After unscrewing the bottom of this specific saber, I was able to plug it in and charge it, and wait till you see this ignition. Fantasy Sabers has an incredible glow that isn't really comparable to other saber companies. Not to mention, the sound on this blade is remarkable. Aside from blowing their competition out of the water with their quality, you can select various sound designs and lightsaber colors so that you can fit the hero or villain you want to be. Go down below and use code HALLOWEEN for 10% off store-wide on Fantasy Saber's Halloween deal, plus the free belt clip that you get with any purchase, or even some of their exclusive holiday bundles so you can get your hands on some of these amazing lightsabers. Special thanks to my friends at Fantasy Folklore for this awesome saber and joining me on this sick collab. Hello! Our story begins on the fields of Ryloth, where Anakin and Ahsoka were finishing up yet another leg of their campaign. After victory over Ryloth came at Ahsoka's maneuver, Obi-Wan and Mace were finishing up their own legs of the battle. Mace was with Cham Syndulla, and Kenobi had freed a group of captured Twi'leks. Anakin and Ahsoka were in the fields. There were battle droids filling up the barren lands of the planet, and the two Jedi were joined with Twi'lek rebels in their pursuit of freedom of their system. Ahsoka was with a clone trooper, one who was dying. His head was wrapped under cloth, and she was holding his hand. It was a show of the dynamic that existed between Jedi and clone, and despite Ahsoka's want and desire to be there for her men, she couldn't do this anymore. The soldier's hand fell limp in hers, and she let him go, patting his forearm lightly as she looked over to her master. Ahsoka's face was distraught. Her body language was pained, and she had nothing but sorrow written across her essence. Anakin could sense this. He was talking to Captain Rex and a resistance commander, and so he turned around. She was staring at him, so he excused himself and walked over to her side, asking if she was alright, and she wasn't. Ahsoka expressed, without a hint of hesitation, her frustration. She felt that this was all wrong. This war was not what being a Jedi was all about. Protectors and Knights of the Galaxy was what her entire life taught her to be. Die in the face of adversity, sure. Die to crime bosses, maybe, but never in a political war. One that made very little sense to most adults in the galaxy, let alone a 14-year-old Jedi Padawan. Ahsoka told her master that she didn't want to do this anymore. She didn't want to serve in a war that would only tear the galaxy apart. The Jedi should have been breaking things down. They should be focusing on all the rights in the galaxy and how to maintain them. They could do so much more by not being a part of this war. Sure, it might cost them their temple on Coruscant, but there were outposts across the galaxy. Couldn't they do something about that? Couldn't they leave the temple on Coruscant and split up, and with such a split, go to both sides of the war and broker a treaty, start a ceasefire? Anakin's hands landed firmly on his hips, and he looked down at his young student. He could feel her anger her fury. It was so much like his own. He was the right teacher for her, and he could feel it. But this was going too far. He believed in the Jedi, and he believed they were on the right path. The one of conscience. The one dedicated to bringing peace to the galaxy. He listened to her as she expressively pointed back at the soldier who had died behind her. She said that these men did not deserve this. They were like her, young. They were child soldiers, dying for some politician on Coruscant, and dying because of another on Raxus. This wasn't their burden, and neither was it theirs. These people, like those of Ryloth, Christophsis, Meridun, and more, didn't deserve to be punished. This war was a failure on the part of the Republic. It was the job of the Jedi to de-escalate, and what happened? He and 200 other Jedi went to Geonosis? She threw her hands down in frustration, wanting to hit something, but nothing being close enough to do so. Anakin asked her what she wanted him to do about this. He couldn't control this war. He couldn't, even if he tried. They had a duty to fulfill. He could be loose about it, or it could be stern. What she wanted was what he would accommodate for her. But this was their position, their place in the galaxy. As Jedi, it was their duty to serve the people affected by the war. He knew it was challenging to understand, maybe even hard to grasp, but what they were doing was the right thing. She turned around, flustered. This was not the right thing, and he needed to accept that. He was far beyond this. They both were. The Jedi were. 
Anakin was very caring towards the subject, because he knew it meant a lot to her, so he listened, asking her what she wanted him to do about any of this. Her eyes drifted towards the men, who had died behind her, before coming back around to Anakin. She didn't know. He tried to reason with her, but this wasn't his battle. She didn't blame him. She was ranting, she was expressive, and she was feeling emotions that the Order did not train for her to have. Asuka turned back and she said under her breath that she didn't want this anymore. Anakin asked what she meant, as he stepped forward towards her, feeling a rift form between the two of them. What did she mean? he asked. And Ahsoka reiterated, she didn't want this. She didn't want to be a Jedi or a commander. She wanted to be there for her troopers, but there were more efficient ways of doing this, and she couldn't imagine continuing it in this way. Anakin tried to calm her down, telling her that they could handle this as one, and she shrugged, not knowing if they could or not. Before they could continue, an explosion sounded off nearby. Rex and the Twili commander yelled out to their respective soldiers and turned to face the battlefield, before charging in together. ATTEs in the distance unloaded their heavy cannons, and operators pressed them forward. Anakin told Ahsoka that he wouldn't force her to join him, but if she wanted to stay with the clones, they could continue this conversation after the battle. He really wanted to hear her out. He cared about her emotions and tried to be accepting of them. But as general, his duty called, and he said that to her. He needed to lead his men in the combat. Skywalker told her that he was always here for her. His lightsaber ignited, and he turned around, calling out to the remaining troopers and telling them to form up behind him as he ran into combat. Ahsoka watched him vanish into a plume of smoke. His lightsaber could be heard buzzing into the fray as it vanished under the haze of explosions and blaster fire. Her eyes drifted towards the wounded camp. She couldn't do this anymore. She couldn't. And while it took her a couple minutes to come up with her sense of direction, she eventually found an LAAT to take to the Resolute, before taking her starfighter and a hyperspace ring and disappearing. Admiral Yularen tried to stop her, but that didn't really do him any good. When Anakin came back, he was informed that Ahsoka had simply vanished, and the tracker on her ship had been taken off. She was gone, somewhere. Panic filled his body, and his heart hurt unlike ever before. He asked around, but no one had the answers. And then came the very excruciating meeting with the other two generals, Mace and Obi-Wan, explaining to them that Ahsoka ran off was devastating, and even further than that, telling the two of them about their conversation leading up to it. Mace and Obi-Wan weren't upset at either of them. Her reaction was validated, and to the Master of the Order, it addressed a fear he had mentioned during a previous session in the Council Chambers. Mace, as Master of the Order, was one of the most integral members of the entire Jedi Order. His role was to look after every single one of the 10,000 Jedi that lived in the galaxy. He had suggested to the Council near the beginning of the war that Padawans be removed from the front lines, or be sent somewhere away from the war to avoid the conflict, being that it could create a generation of Jedi that viewed war as a necessary means to an end. It seemed in the case with Padawan Tano that he was kind of correct. However, the fact that the young were being so violently shifted because of the combat meant that the change had already begun. Mace wished the Council hadn't been so adamant on the strength and resilience of their young. The trauma alone could disrupt this entire generation. Regardless, Mace suggested to Anakin that he look around the planets they had been to as a duo and see if he could find her. Obi-Wan affirmed this point and believed that Mace Windu was right. Ahsoka would only go somewhere she knew and she felt comfortable with. Obi-Wan was more apologetic for this having happened, but he did now see Mace's stance that he brought up in the Council Chambers before. Obi-Wan told Anakin to go swiftly, find her before the Separatists do. Mace was in agreement with that. They didn't want Ahsoka to be absorbed into the dark and downtrodden path of the Sith. If Dooku could find her, he could manipulate her, like he was. That was something the Jedi and Anakin, especially, could not afford to allow. Anakin nodded and very quickly left, taking his Jedi Starfighter and leaving Ryloth. All command of the operation shifted to Rex, and General Windu made sure that Anakin's fleet remained in position above Ryloth until he returned. Anakin tried Coruscant first. It seemed like a dumb idea, but it really wasn't. Ahsoka knew Coruscant because it was her home. Surely she wouldn't go far from it. He searched the planet and the city for several days, not finding anything. He asked around the Jedi Temple and kept tabs on former planets that they had been to. Christophsis, Teth, Ryloth, and Naboo had no signs of her. Anakin didn't think she'd go to Naboo because of the whole Blue Shadow Virus incident. That was pretty bad, even in his mind. Something that was drastically affecting Anakin was his guilt, though. He felt like this was his fault, when in reality it was further from the truth. Because of this overwhelming guilt, his mind wasn't fully operating. 
There was a deep tug at his heart, and with a lack of continuous updates for him, he really felt like she was gone forever, which he was not alright with. Anakin, one night inside the temple, woke up in a shock. He finally had it. He was dreaming about being on the front lines, and he was barricading a door with the Force, protecting Ayla, Ahsoka, Bly, and Rex, before an explosion knocked him out. He woke up on a different planet and was with Rex or someone else. He wasn't really sure, but that didn't matter right now. He knew where his apprentice had gone. Anakin slid out of his room, quickly shuffling down the halls and into the hangar, where he took a Jedi T-6 shuttle and left for Meridun. He didn't even wait for clone scouts to give him the report. There was a feeling, a gut instinct that told him his apprentice was there. When he exited hyperspace, he could see a duo of Light Republic Arquentans class cruisers, maintaining a defense of the planet. The Republic couldn't do much in the way of properly defending Meridun, because it had nothing of interest for the Republic, but the humanitarian side of the war effort forced two Republic cruisers to be present over the planet, just in case the Separatists wanted to try and exterminate the Lumen again. Anakin deposited a clearance code, and was permitted to pass. Surely Ahsoka had done the same. She hadn't. When he landed, he could see her Jedi Starfighter. It was covered up loosely by a tarp. He walked over towards it, and he could hear his name be called. He turned over and saw Ahsoka walking towards him. His heart rate jumped with excitement, and he started over towards her, asking if she was alright. Ahsoka crossed her arms and nodded her head, asking him why he had followed her. Anakin was surprised by this tone. He had been stressed out of his mind, hoping to find her and now he had and she really didn't have much excitement to share back with him. Ahsoka slipped away from the harshness of her tone, apologizing and expressing that it wasn't his fault the war was happening, and she was directing her frustration wrongly. Ahsoka suggested that they talk about this and her decision away from the village, and Anakin nodded his head. As the two, Master and Apprentice, walked away from the Lerman village, Ahsoka said that she understood that Anakin wanted to chase her because she was his student, but having been out here, alone, with the Lerman for the past week, had given her clairvoyance. She didn't want him to feel bad, she didn't want the burden to fall onto him, but she needed to know, and now she did. Ahsoka no longer wanted to participate in this war. It was terrible, and she believed it wasn't right to do. She believed the Order should be doing something to stop it, more to stop it other than fighting. Ahsoka did admit that she felt bad for abandoning the clones, but this was her decision. She wasn't running, but searching for another method. Anakin swung his hands over his hips, and asked this to her in a fresh tone. So she was throwing her whole life away to do the same thing the Jedi were doing but her way? Ahsoka shook her head. Maybe they interpreted the lesson of their order differently, but this was not the Jedi order she grew up with. Ahsoka told Anakin that she was sorry, and she knew this was probably a burden on him, but she would not go back. She was going to find the cure to this war, as the Jedi should have. Anakin told her in an almost passive-aggressive tone that he wasn't going to go back either. If she believed she was as wise as Master Yoda, or the minds of the Collective Council, then he wanted to see her prove it. Ahsoka was confused. She could tell that Anakin was being passive-aggressive. To what extent, she wasn't sure. But for Anakin, he was being as snide as he could be. He wanted her to prove to him that it was as easy as she was making it out to be. Surely, if it was as easy enough for a 14-year-old to do it, then it wouldn't be hard for a Jedi Council of multiple hundreds of years of combined experience to do it. In a way, Anakin was hoping that this would knock Ahsoka out of her delusions. In another way, he was hoping that she would see this as a challenge to overcome. Ahsoka looked at Anakin as he, still with his hands on his hips, asked Grandmaster Tano what she was going to be doing with this new Jedi Order, and she looked at him with frustration, and also annoyance. Of course Anakin would ride the wave, so now she had to definitely live with her decisions. Ahsoka turned around and looked at the sky. It was dusk, and she told him that she'd have an answer for him by the end of the week. Anakin rolled his eyes and told her to take her time. When that week did come to an end, Anakin had transmitted his information back to the council, informing them that he would not be at his post for a while. He did distribute a personal message to the men of the 501st, Captain Rex and Admiral Yularen. He just wanted to be transparent to all of them, and also, he was trying to be supportive and challenging to his student. Ahsoka, at the end of the week, had a number of pages written on what she wanted to accomplish. Despite Anakin wanting to take his passive aggressiveness to another level by telling her that she couldn't use the T-6 because it belonged to the Jedi Order of old, he also didn't want to waste any more time on this obvious side quest. Everything Ahsoka thought she knew about the Order was undone during their first mission together. She believed they could go out into the Outer Rim and start helping people. She started with a world at the edge of the Outer Rim called Lorda. 
there was a small townspeople that hadn't been impacted by the war, but as Ahsoka went to help them, they cared not. There was so little these Jedi could do for them. The people didn't want handouts from an order that pretended to care under the guise of government mandate. What a tough reality to learn. While helping people was the Jedi way, it was a little bit more political than most Jedi even liked to believe it was. Helping people always came at a cost, and the Order wanting to be most efficient at assisting needed aid from the Galactic Republic to make it work. This came in the form of credits, manpower, legislation, and more. The Jedi Order worked on their own, but if they could get support from the Republic, then they could be the most effective at their work. Ahsoka's philosophy revolved around everything she learned as a young one about how the Order and its members were selfless, and how they operated out of the care and the well-being of those around the galaxy. Those key and core values didn't change when it came to getting sucker from the Republic. What changed was the magnitude of the effect they had. Anakin never liked supporting the Jedi Council or even their motives, but at this point, with not too many reasons to distrust them, Ahsoka was kind of in the wrong. The Order didn't refuse to act out of negligence. Their hands were always tied. Was it political? Yeah. Did that help? Not really. But the point still stood. They could do most of their work in selected areas with Republic support. This of course is why slavery ran rampant in the Outer Rim. It's why criminal syndicates were able to remain in business. It wasn't like the Jedi weren't trying or even petitioning, but the Senate wouldn't bite the bullet to assist the people. They were comfortable in the Mid-Rim and Core. Why start a conflict that didn't need to start? Of course, when the promise of galactic scale war came, they dug their silver spoons into it so they could share in the spoils of war, but that was another story for another time. When Master and Apprentice returned to Meridun, he asked her if she was done with the self-righteous expedition, and she said she wasn't. She was truthfully appalled by his demeanor towards their work. Anakin wasn't being super serious, he was mostly poking fun at her, but she was fully invested, and she was annoyed that he wasn't. In a funny way though, without Anakin's super sarcastic tone, she likely wouldn't have developed such a can-do attitude. So much of Ahsoka's original drive came from belief that the war was going wrong and that Jedi should do more, and while the base was fundamentally important to her rationale to stay out here, she now wanted to prove Anakin wrong, because he was irritating her, even though he was just trying to be a funny guy. As a result, Ahsoka decided on a different approach, to try and capture the feeling of the order she knew, there had to be a more efficient method. The thing is, without realizing it, Ahsoka was latching onto both a part of innocence and a part of the Jedi Order that was irreplaceable. The combination of childhood purity and even nostalgia for the pre-war Jedi Order was overtaking her. But the main disconnect between Master and Apprentice was how this factor drove everything for them. Ahsoka was latching onto something that would never come back. She would never have a childlike innocence, especially not after fighting in the Clone War. That part of her had died off in her first battle. But childhood purity doesn't die with maturity. It can be recaptured. It can transform into new understandings and new passions. Ahsoka had to find that and learn that. The first step to doing so was traveling the Jeddah city, west of the deep core in the mid-rim. Master and Apprentice went to Jeddah to speak to a group of people. Ahsoka had become interested in the other four sects of the galaxy. Because she didn't realize she lost what she was looking for, the only way to locate it was by evolving. And like her, Ahsoka's view and understanding of the Jedi Order needed to change into something new. Instead of outwardly trying to help the people on Jeddah, Ahsoka simply observed, until she found what she was looking for. Aside from the Jedi, there were other groups that younglings were made aware of, one of such groups being the Guardians of the Wills, which were mostly located here inside the ancient city. Ahsoka and one of the Guardians' wiser members spoke up. Chirrut was a native to Jeddah, born blind. He believed that everything was connected to the Force, and while well, he didn't have a show of Force abilities, it was a high religious belief in the Force that he was able to be effective as a living being. Ahsoka and Chirrut spoke for several hours about the Force, the philosophy of it, and even how the Guardians of the Wills perceived their place in all of this. Chirrut spoke highly of the Jedi, despite how many of the people around here thought of them. What Chirrut reminded Ahsoka is how ideas are often shifted when comfort changes. When the people of the galaxy felt pressure on them from external devices, such as the Clone War, they were forced to alienate something that shouldn't have become that. Chirrut told her to look into his eyes. Forsake them he did when he was young. A sightless child trying to play with seeing children wasn't always the greatest gift. His purity had been taken from him at a young age. 
the life of one surrounded by darkness would be considered a curse by one gifted with the presence of sight. But Chirrut said that through his darkness he envisioned his own light, he found his own placement, and through the force he could be more than what he initially believed he was. He patted the ground with his staff. The Jedi had taught her well. Her curiosity, though, was her greatest strength. Her journey to new beginnings would be founded through this childlike wonder, this light in this darkness. While Ahsoka hadn't mentioned her own decision to try and rebirth a Jedi Order, she learned a great deal from the blind man. Chira told Ahsoka one final thing. Through idealistic purity would she be able to guide others. What the Jedi had foiled for themselves was not their ideals or their effect. What they had done was seclude themselves from their own connection. Not to the Force or to themselves, but how little it took to make a big change. The people around looked at the Jedi with fondness for a long time, and yet no Jedi were here. The Jedi hadn't been here since the war started, and yet the people had changed their view of them. In that, Ahsoka would find what it took to change her own perception of not just herself, but the future she wanted to build. She would nod with a smile, looking off into the distance. He told Ahsoka that she had a heart of Kyber, one that could guide the masses. She couldn't be afraid of that gift. If she feared it, then she'd become grey and lose her touch. Trust the Force was what the message he imparted her with, and if she ever needed a friend, the Guardians of the Wills were always here. Ahsoka got up and turned around to see Master Plo Koon. His arms were crossed, and his hood was raised above his head. She looked at Anakin who stepped back and out of the way. Plo had been listening for a majority of this conversation, just as Anakin had. Skywalker wanted to see if Master Plo could talk Ahsoka out of this righteous path, but instead, after listening to her heart, he could not do that. She belonged on this journey, and he truthfully wanted to support her. What Chirrut said was true, but there was still so much more Ahsoka needed to learn about the Force and those who used it. By this point, the Council was well aware of this undertaking, and especially with Plo assisting, they now had full eyes and ears inside of this little movement. Plo Koon would send Ahsoka on two missions. The first would be to his own home world of Dorin, where he would guide her to meet the Keldor sect of Force users called the Barando Sages. These mystics were protectors of the locals, and through their connection to the Force, their impact was felt planet-wide. This was yet another introspective look at what the Force meant to the people, and why the message of the Jedi had been lost through their entanglement with Republic politics. Master Plo, after that mission, then sent Ahsoka to Shilling, Ahsoka's own homeworld, where she would meet another Jedi Master. At Shilling, Ahsoka would finally reunite with Master Shock Team, who would take Ahsoka and Anakin on a 13-day journey. There was a religious sect on Shili as well, just another group that existed amongst the stars. The Bozik priestesses of Shili were a group much like the Barando Sages, however their influence over weather patterns wasn't as renowned. The priestesses of Shili had a purpose, to cultivate the young minds and hearts of this planet. Like Shock Team, she understood that these religious types believed in the expansion of knowledge and understanding of the Force. Through the Force, they found strength and unity. Again, much like the previous groups of Force worshippers, their effect on the people around them was incomparable. Unlike the Jedi, these groups held a strong place in the hearts of those near them. Following this, Shock T and Plo Koon agreed to escort Ahsoka to the planet of Dathomir for her final interaction, an added one suggested by Shock T herself. While Plo and Shock T had no intention of fully abandoning the Jedi Order, they did believe individually that this mission was imperative for their younger generation inside the Jedi Order. They believed that Ahsoka would return to their Order and be the guide for her generation. This information could be the lessons they needed by a future Grand Master, lessons that nothing could compare to, especially ones taught inside the Order itself. On Dathomir, Ahsoka would meet Mother Talon. Initially, Ahsoka was very skeptical of this, and the extra Jedi protection seemed to put the Witch into a space of hostility. But if the Jedi were willing to learn, then perhaps something more could come from it. Talzin was merely interested in the benefits for her sisters, so helping Ahsoka was only for the potential of benefiting her clan. Ahsoka's lessons with Talzin would reflect those with the previous religious communities. While Talzin was more interested in the ability to wield the Force for power and self-interest, the effect it had on her clan was similar in essence to what the other religions had on their local populations. Ahsoka told Mother Talzin that she wished to form an alliance with her. Old Daka, an ancient witch, who was walking into this conversation, believed that such an alliance would be beneficiary for all of them. And so, Mother Talzin formed a bond with Ahsoka. 
one that turned them both into allies. When the quartet returned to Meridum, Shock T and Plo believed that Ahsoka would return to Coruscant after her multiple month lesson. Shock T and Plo had been informing the Jedi Council of these developments. They believed Ahsoka was coming around to them, but she secretly wasn't. She was seeing a need for a more developed Jedi Order, one that represented more of the galaxy. The Council had become invested in this project because Ahsoka was like Anakin, a prodigy, and that could be conditioned into the perfect future member of the High Council. However, despite Ahsoka being the true learner in all of this, it was Plo, Shock T, and Anakin who started to see, like Ahsoka, this new way. There was nothing fundamentally wrong with the morality or even the dogma of the Jedi Order. However, the issues with the current status of the Order came from its dogma. What Ahsoka had learned and truly understood at this point was the need for a religious order that understood the people it was meant to represent. The divide between the Jedi and the people of the galaxy was a political one. The Jedi were trying to be too much, when the simplicity of their actions had garnered them a reputation to begin with. The childlike innocence of their mandate was one the people of the galaxy could empathize with, not the warlike knights that now stood. Sure, in the past there were warriors, but this was a different war. This was neighboring systems fighting against the other. The Clone War may have had a fancy name regarding the nature of Republic troopers, but the reality of this war was it was a galactic divorce, and the Jedi chose a side. The people didn't know or care about a generational duel of the Sith that wasn't in the public eye. They cared about the dedication of the Jedi Order, and it was gone. It had dissipated, and it lost its presence in the decades leading up to the Galactic Divide. But that was because the Jedi had chosen their side before the divorce was set into motion. Ahsoka, now 15, had spent the last several months gathering information, preparing for her own thesis on all of this. Jedi education was fine. It was very useful for creating young and talented students of understanding and empathy, which was Ahsoka. The young former Jedi told everyone that her new Jedi Order wasn't just the Jedi. She didn't want it to be that. She knew that with a title that had the name Jedi in it wouldn't resonate. There would be a united order. That name didn't really work by the way. They could pick one later. The masters were curious now. The three who had been guiding her during this journey were curious on where she would go with all of this. It would decide their own paths after all. Ahsoka believed a galactic community, one that existed between each religious sect across the galaxy was needed. That too included the witches of Dathomir. The force worked through all of them, and the people were hopeless. If they could inspire change and hope, then they could resonate where the Jedi could not anymore. Shock, T, and Plo looked to each other. In an effort to create a student of the Force and a young mind eager to lead the next generation of Jedi, they had transformed a Jedi Padawan into a generational guide. The irony of this proved how mysterious the Force was, and how it always worked in puzzling or peculiar ways. As a result, the Four wouldn't sever their ties or connection to the Order, but they would revoke their status as full-time Jedi. This was not a rejection of the old Order, rather a decision to grow beyond. The purity of Ahsoka's decision resonated. It was about the people, but helping individuals on a galactic level wouldn't work either. It didn't work for the Jedi of 10,000, so it wouldn't work for an order of four. Instead, this was about bringing galactic community together. Ahsoka would have to write out her own quote-unquote rules for this new system or new sect, but Ahsoka truthfully didn't think of it as something new. It was just the natural evolution of something that had fallen behind. She didn't want the Jedi to feel like they were rivals, she only wanted to embrace the purity of what she grew up within. And as she tried to construct a rulebook for this new order, she realized it wasn't that. Ahsoka had developed a little bit of a rough art during her travels, just as a way to emotionally communicate her emotions to herself. Little doodles that spoke to her, and what she crafted here was something reminiscent of a well of the fours. Ahsoka had drawn herself on one knee, bearing water into a small pool with her right hand. In her left hand, she was doing the same, but instead of a small pool of already filled water, she was dumping onto the ground. Over her shoulder was a small bird, one that was reminiscent of a species that inhabited Meridun. Her singular focus was on pouring the water. Behind her, there were slight mountains, and above them were seven miniature stars and one larger one that sat in the middle. So much of this message, this meaning, this vision of the star, was the creation of something new. Gentility, emotion, vulnerability, but also security, guidance, and at the end of it all, completion. It was with this that she realized that this new Jedi Order was truthfully the well of the Force. She was confident with this, and with it came growth. 
Plo, Shant, T, Anakin, and Ahsoka fully left the Jedi Order. Ahsoka sent each of them out, including herself, from Meridun to unite the other religious groups they'd come across. Nothing would change them. All that would become new is their interconnectedness. The Jedi had always been the dominant presence of religious force wielders and believers, but this wasn't a singular giant of religious influence. This was everyone's home. The galaxy was for everyone. Despite the influence Ahsoka's new well of the force would have, it wouldn't directly change the impact of the war, except in one instance. Midway through the second year of combat, Anakin and Plo were redirected to Dathomir, where they would help Asajj Ventress destroy General Grievous and relocate the witches before the Separatists wiped them out. It was a very arduous mission for the two former Jedi, but it was something that was almost entirely disavowed by the Jedi Order of Old. They would have never attacked the Knight Sisters, but they also weren't against letting them be destroyed. It seemed counterproductive for the Jedi to keep an organization around that used the darkness, but in accordance to what Ahsoka and her compatriots understood, it wasn't in their usage of the dark side that they were bad. Because the witches were not simply bad, they did not harm the Force. They pushed it to its boundaries, sure, but unlike the Sith, they did not break the threshold of how far the Force was willing to go. If they did, an event similar to Anakin's birth would have transpired by this point. Tragically for the Jedi, especially those who didn't end up redirecting their efforts into this new order, they'd be caught flat-footed when the Clone War came to an end. Palpatine never really needed Anakin for Order 66. He was a benefit, a cherry on top. But Dooku was killed by Windu in a duel, and the Jedi Master was killed in Order 66, so win-win. Despite the Well of the Force being made up of around 100 former Jedi by the time Order 66 was executed, they did not exist in or around clone military groups. A few interacted, but because they weren't members of the Republic, they never could stay on base or around bases. In the two years leading up to the destruction of the Jedi Order, the Well of the Force was able to unite several groups of Force users around the galaxy. This tight-knit bond created a more stable galactic citizenry. The war was still terrible, and no one refuted that, but there was a larger sense of galactic community. That aside from kings and pawns, there were regular people on both sides of the galactic divorce that were affected tremendously by battle droids or clone troopers. It was through the work of the Well of the Force that these people were guided. To help them was temporary, to guide them was eternal. That was the point, too. Ahsoka didn't come up with any ground rules, but she didn't force the idea that their mission statement was presence. The formal issue with the Jedi for most people is how they felt so far away. Their pieces on the war board was kings. They, like Republic officers, senators, and chancellors, were the leaders, whereas the soldiers, the ones the people saw, were pawns. When the Well of the Force started to arise across the galaxy, they gave people hope for an alternative future. So with the onslaught of Order 66, Jedi refugees from the war ended up reunited with former members who abandoned the Jedi path. The Night Sisters no longer lived on Dathomir. The Singing Mountain Clan currently held position over the planet, but they still were nowhere near as domineering as the Night Sisters were. Instead, these refugees united on Dantooine, a former Jedi outpost that was transformed into a hub of members of various Force groups across the galaxy. About 30 Jedi survivors of Order 66, due to the temple being bombarded, because without Anakin, who cared, came to this temple. These survivors found home, and, like the people of the galaxy, they understood what was so important about this order. Anakin, throughout the war and even out of it, hadn't lost or changed his relationship with Padme. It was actually a lot more trusting because they weren't hiding it. Shakti, Plo, and Ahsoka knew about the entire thing, and truthfully, they wouldn't have cared if he had told them when they were Jedi. Anakin and Padme weren't currently having children because timing. Things didn't connect. You know, that whole thing. Anyways, General Grievous' death on Dathomir didn't also change a whole lot. With Palpatine and Dooku manipulating the war, it really didn't matter. Ahsoka nearing the end of the Clone War before Order 66 was drawn from Dantooine to Atalan, where she met the Great Bendu. His advice to her was to keep going. She had done something no other group had ever done. This unity, the one that existed through each and every collection of Force wielders and believers, hadn't been achieved on a level like this before. The Jedi always existed as the strongest unit, but now the Well of the Force could create a community. However, there remained one true threat to the sect, and it was Palpatine. Despite being a relatively non-violent sect similar to the Jedi, they still had their lightsabers and even encouraged the use of kyber crystals for weapons of defense. So at the end of an era dominated by the Republic, the rise of an empire took a hold of the galaxy. 
Palpatine's evil regime rose, and with it, knowledge of the Force was outlawed. In an effort to ensure the Jedi were killed and never returned, he prepared steps to ensure their destruction. Palpatine did try to have a new apprentice, but for the first time since being Plaguey's a student, he was without his own student. Grand Inquisitor was an unlucky scratch. He attempted to drag a Jedi into the Sith, but he was killed by said Jedi. Part of Palpatine wished he had spent more time focusing on Anakin, but even he knew that it wasn't the worst situation in the galaxy. An apprentice would come, for now, Imperial clone troopers would be sent to take down surviving Jedi. Thanks to the unity within the Well of the Force, Mother Talzin agreed with the heads of the sect that Palpatine was their largest threat. She and Old Doc had prepared their trap for the Sith Lord, and the Jedi from Dantooine moved in to assist this trap. The trap for Sidious would take place on Dathomir, following a wave of visions implanted into Palpatine's brain by Mother Talzin. While Yoda did survive, he did not join the mission to Dathomir, mostly because he was unaware of it, or said he was. Sidious, being tormented by the witches of Dathomir, prepared his own counter. Being that they were cleared out of their home, he didn't expect them to go back, but they did. Mother Talzin and Old Docker were true rivals in the Force of Palpatine, like Yoda. He had every intention to go to their home world and clear them out. Sidious did, in a way, fear these witches. Instead of going alone, he brought a unit of clone troopers, the 501st being one of the most elite units to join him on their expedition to the Witch homeworld. When they arrived, they found four Jedi waiting outside the mouth of the Dathomiri cave. He was surprised. He thought he'd find old witches, but this was not that. He would still kill these fools for siding with the Dathomiri. Sidious knew that these four Jedi wouldn't be a problem anyways. The most challenging members, quote unquote, would be Shakti and Plo Koon, because they were long established masters. Ahsoka and Anakin were young, inexperienced, and they barely fought in the war, so no problem there. The four Jedi expanded their weapons, and they prepared for his attack. Sidious mocked him as he moved in. He sent the clones into the cave to kill the witches. Sidious drove his lightsabers at the Jedi, telling them to die. He wanted them all gone. It was their time to end. It was the age of the Sith, and his empire. Plo and Shakti got out of the way, avoiding strikes. Anakin swung in before slipping to the side and avoiding a nearly deadly jab by Palpatine. Ahsoka was last in line, and Sidious dove at her, using a Sith helm, going for the kill. She slipped backwards, nearly being hit as the other three Jedi rushed to her aid. Ahsoka, the leader of such an important movement, was on her back foot, trying to not get hit by a single strike. Palpatine pushed forward, swinging with viciousness, trying to end her life. Ahsoka fell backwards, and as she did, Sidious smiled, turning towards the other three Jedi and telling them that they would watch their youngest die before being consumed by his own power. They all cried out, telling him to not do it. He smiled, laughing as he did it, before jabbing his lightsaber into her abdomen and twisting. She didn't react. Sidious looked back, and the three Jedi were gone. His eyes moved around before realizing he was inside their cave. He then saw the clones crowd in agony as green light slid into their helmets and they became zombified. They turned their attention to Sidious and charged him. Palpatine pulled his saber out of the ground and Ahsoka was still there. She smiled with a crophophagous grin. She vanished from beneath his blade with a wink and he screamed out Talzin's name. Like a demon, she appeared in multiple forms, telling Sidious that their long-time truce was at an end. It was terminated when he sent that wretch servant Grievous to destroy her home. With he and Dooku gone, Sidious' death would mark the end of their religion. He wailed in anger, blasting lightning, but there was no use. He would spend the rest of his days fighting off the undead horde of Dathomir, chopping up hundreds of the undead, including recently zombified clones. There'd be no escape. The two witches, Talzin and Old Daka, would make sure that his death was painful. The four Jedi who had used Force Projection were actually on Dathomir, and so were Talzin and Daka. They were all inside the Singing Mountain Clan overlooking the remnants of the Night Sister Village. Mother of Singing Mountain Clan provided a healing ritual to protect each of the Jedi and the witches as they used the Force to end the Sith. In the truest two Jedi form possible, Ahsoka, Plo, Shakti, and Anakin destroyed Sidious without an attack. They used the Force for knowledge and defense, and they lured him into a trap, where individuals, Talzin and Daka, who didn't follow such rules of purity, could destroy him in their own way. Ironically, the former Jedi didn't even follow that code anymore, but it was a show of the purity they had reached since abandoning their order. All the dogma instilled into them from a young age existed, but without the overwhelming presence of galactic political duty, they were able to approach and defeat evil without sacrificing a moral code that would have existed for them had they still been Jedi. 
The Spite Cities being destroyed and Maul dying during Agon Kolar and Kit Fisto's invasion of Mandalore before Order 66, the Sith were gone. However, this did not change the course of history for the Empire. It would still loom large, and Palpatine's initial policy would remain. But there was something else. The sense of community that now existed on both sides of the previous Galactic Divine outweighed the sense of patriotism for the new Galactic Empire. This left the Senate in a bind. The Well of the Force had unified the people. So while gods and generals were deciding the political outcome of a war, the people were coming together and realizing that they were not so different. The unity between systems brought the galaxy closer together. The problem with the galaxy was not the Force, nor its practice. The problem with it was its politicization in the galactic sphere. The Jedi were victims of such politicization. But the will of the Force, the star of the galaxy, was not that problem. And the people finally had not a government to rely on, but the community of each other. And they were one. There was room for Ahsoka to establish herself as a Grand Master of Swords, but she never took it. The Remnant Jedi Order on Dantooine was a loosely built collection of former Jedi that abided by their code by their own discretion. This allowed individuals like Anakin and eventually Caleb Doom to build relationships with others and maintain them in whatever form they wished. The Well of the Force wasn't any one way of following or using the Force. It was an outstretched community that existed within each star system. It was a collection of peoples whose understanding varied, and yet everything bubbled down to one mutual understanding. The Force was the life force of the galaxy. It bound every living being to one another, and it was through the Force that the community of the galaxy could unite. Ahsoka's life work wasn't just influential, it was generational, but the beauty of it was it was simply just a guide. It was willed by individuals, individuals who made strong communities, strong communities that rallied people, people that fostered togetherness, togetherness that became a constant in the galaxy, a galaxy now fully unified, even under an empire. A galaxy would find itself moving forward by choice, one that would benefit the lives of each and every sentient that existed in every and each quadrant of the galaxy, a true and collective well of the Force. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to all of our patrons. Benjamin Wells, Ozpin, Darth Vitiate, Seiju Jagger, Brood36, Hunter Belden, Rosebird, Angel Dust, Alexander Reese, The Beginning and End, Django Fett Clone, Nick5098, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galama Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Granite D. Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Colin Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlinger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was 70, Annika Steak Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Nox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Deguin, Seth Skelton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. E Gamer, Lord Cali, Yelling Slayer 66, Man Minute Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Fortis Lakes of Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, Man with Three First Names, Dark Sea 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. Force Point Channel. Special shout out to Fantasy Folklore for joining me on this awesome collab. Go check out their version of the story. They did Anakin's side of the creating a Jedi Order. So let's talk about the story. Fantasy and I agreed that we should start the story on Ryloth, with Ahsoka getting overwhelmed by that frustration. Then we go to Meridon, that's where our points diverge. I think by this point, Ahsoka would have a struggle with really seeing the issue with the Jedi Order, which is not their issue. They're not really the bad guys. They're just too politicized, and I think that's what their problem was. They got so lost in the sauce, they couldn't really go anywhere. And I think she would try and fix it the Jedi way, which is what she does at the beginning and fails, because the Jedi way doesn't really do that. Uh, and so she kind of goes forward, and I really, really love the interaction she has with Chirrut and Ahsoka. When I started writing this, I was like, I need that interaction to happen. And I wanted to build this community, the idea that this community between other uh, four sects can really unite the galaxy together, unite people through a common interest, a common thing that helps people, right? And I think the Jedi kind of lost sight of that as they grew into a more politicized state with the Republic, because they're, they're seen by everybody. But this new Jedi Order, if you will, or the Well of the Force, exists hidden, it's not present, it's not visible with an order or a temple, it's just people acting to help other people. So if you want to see more collabs with Fantasy, Galaxy, whoever, smash that like button, let us know down below. I love you all, spread the love, and always, my, my friends, may the Force be with you.